the lander module has begun its descent towards the landing site. If the importance of space exploration is measured by steps and leaps for mankind, this was a hop, skip and a jump of a success for the Indian Republic. India became only the fourth country to land on the moon, but the first to make it to the lunar south pole. The Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft landed at 6.04 p.m. local time, putting India into the history books, and didn't those at Space Control in Bengaluru know it? Beamed in and beaming from the BRIC summit in South Africa, Prime Minister Narendra Modi was very much front and center. This moment is unprecedented. This is a proclamation of a developed India. This moment is New India's victory cry. Such is the symbolism of India's triumph that in the days and hours ahead of this perilous landing, a deeply religious nation came together in mosques, temples, schools and offices. On a rocket wing and a prayer, they did it. For India, it is huge, I think, because see, India started this journey in planetary exploration in the 2000s. So in a space of 20 years, having done the multiple orbiters around the moon, and now they have a lander and a rover on the moon. So going from, you know, so it, I think it's, it, it's huge. India's feat is phenomenal also due to how little they've spent. The budget for the Chandrayaan-3 mission was around $74 million. That's smaller than the amount spent on the Hollywood films Gravity or Interstellar. Russia's space agency budget was around $2.9 billion last year, while China spent an estimated $12 billion. And NASA, which wants to land people on the moon by 2025, is expected to fork out $93 billion in getting there. Two, one... Zero. India managed to do this partly due to cheap labor, but the Chandrayaan-3 also didn't use huge expensive rockets, instead using several orbits of the Earth to then catapult it to the lunar south pole. Many countries want to reach that area because scientists believe frozen water could hold the key to setting up permanent bases, with the potential too for mining minerals. Even uh, if uh, any of these nations are able to access water, access minerals, you still have to take that and convert it into a usable form. Part of this race, though, is, you know, the nation that gets there first, they set the rules of the game. That's why today, even though Russia's Sergei Lavrov congratulated his Indian counterpart, there was no hint of a smile because Russia's attempt to get to the South Pole failed this weekend. And while Moscow has a pact with China on space, in June, Modi signed India up to the Artemis Accords, an American-led treaty that seeks international cooperation and peace in space. China and Russia have not signed up to those accords, and that's led to fears of what Beijing in particular might do next. They are going full throttle in, in expanding their space capabilities, not just on the civilian and exploration front, but what they're doing on the national security side that is incredibly opaque. They also have increased their, uh, what we call counter space weapons. So their ability to hold at risk other countries' satellite capabilities, and that is concerning. This is a far cry from the last space race when the UN brokered the 1967 Outer Space Treaty and the 1979 Moon Agreement setting out the idea that space wasn't right for political picking and posturing. This treaty means that the moon and our sister planets will serve only the purposes of peace and not of war. Despite the dark side of this moon race, it can't dampen the joy and pride felt by so many Indian citizens today. Space has always had the ability to inspire, and so for now they can savour the stars above. Kira Moodley reporting there. Dr. Namrata Goswami is an author and professor based in Alabama who specializes in space policy and international relations. I spoke to her earlier and I began by asking how much of a triumph this was for India and what it means for its competitors, Russia and China.
For India, it's a triumph because it's a completely self-reliant end-to-end space capacity that India has built. So on its own, indigenously. So it's a big triumph. And also it now tells you that India has moved ahead of Russia. It showcases to you that India has now that capacity for autonomous landing and docking. For China, it's a very interesting strategic period because China is planning to send a mission to the South Pole next year called the Chang'er 6. That particular mission will also do exactly what India has done, autonomously land as well as collect samples. So the fact that India succeeded a year earlier gives India and the Artemis Accord signatories a year ahead of understanding the lunar terrain mm. and looking for space resources as well. In terms of the practical purpose of the mission, number one aim to find water, which is thought to be on, on the South Pole um, of the Moon, and then use that as a launch pad to explore deep space. Is that your reading of it? The experiments on the rover is to study the lunar surface for not just water ice, but also to study lunar resources like aluminium, titanium, iron ore, silicon to, uh, without any doubt, prove that lunar regolith, which is soil, has it. So once confirmed, this is going to be actually utilize for further missions. Hmm. So all this is going to help in terms of these deep space missions as well. Let's talk about the money of this. Um, one of the incredible things about today is that India's budget is a mere millions compared to the US spending billions on their uh, Artemis rocket, moon rocket. Um, but I mean, I suppose some might still ask, you know, when, it, when there are so many problems in our own backyard, why not fix them rather than reaching for the stars as well? I think what is missed in that particular debate is that space actually has improved our lives ter tremendously. For example, we depend on the global positioning system for navigation. We depend on satellite internet, disaster warning, weather forecasting. And so fast forward to the moon, if you're really thinking about building an end-to-end -end system, and this time it's more commercial, it's more about how you can utilize the resources of the moon to benefit humanity. So what is fascinating today is that during the COVID, it was a lot about which particular strategic alignment is more attractive on Earth. For example, is it the Soviet Union or is it the United States? Today, if you listen to the rationale of the missions from China, from India, from the US, it's a lot about cislunar space, which is the space between the Earth and the moon, having commercial benefit. So does that mean that India can expect, uh, you know, a return on its investment because it spent so much less? It does. It does mean that India expects return on its investment, as well as the fact that India had signed the Artemis Accords. So which means India's real-time operational capability to the moon can be utilized by the Artemis partners for studying the moon, for studying the South Pole and utilizing the data for actually bringing down cost on their own. Yeah. But is there a risk that the moon um, treaty of 1979 should in theory stop India using this advantage to its commercial advantage? Um, but in, in a way that's untested, isn't it? I mean, how might that not be enforced in the future? And so the moon treaty, actually the it's not, India has not ratified it, so it's signed it, but not ratified. The US is not a part, nor is China, nor is Russia. So the Moon Treaty does not hold valid when it comes to major spacefaring nations. So the Artemis Accord push was that we will have to have a system that is more democratic, more representative, and has a possibility of sharing the resources to the extent possible that benefits the uh, signatory nations. But that system so, isn't there yet, is it? And I just wonder whether there is sufficient accountability and democratic accountability in India to ensure that there are checks and balances. I would say that the system is starting to be conceptualized. I wouldn't say it's not there at all. But work in would, progress, it needs to be expedited, doesn't yes. it? We do not have the dispute resolution mechanisms in place yet. And so we we have we are anticipating that there shouldn't be any issue because everybody has signed the Outer Space Treaty. But as you know, international law does not have enforceability. It, it's it's the enforceability part is still very weak. Dr. Namita Goswami, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for having me.